감사합니다. Well, it's my pleasure to be here in Louisville. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kay Mazur, uh, who has uh, been uh, so instrumental in um, uh, the arts here in, uh, in Kentucky, in Louisville, and helped bring me here, and um, the director of the library, Jim Blanton. Uh, thank you for those kind remarks. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm honored to be here um, uh, in the uh, native state of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and uh, I have a few remarks to make about uh, Lincoln, uh, including the influence of Kentucky on him. And uh, it was far greater, I think, than uh, most people understand. Now, I uh, like to read something. And this is my poor imitation of being Charles Dickens on tour. So I, uh, and uh, this enables me to try and communicate a lot of information in a, I hope, a relatively short period of time, after which I would appreciate any questions you have, and I only hope I have answers. Um, this is, uh, I'm here to speak about the second volume of a four-volume work on the political life of Abraham Lincoln. This volume is called Wrestling with His Angel. This book takes its uh, title from the story of Jacob in the Bible, who wrestled through a long night with an angel, and at the break of dawn came to realize a new identity and took a new name. His new name was Israel. Uh, and this is something like what Lincoln went through, but it wasn't one long night. It was many years. The more time I have spent with Abraham Lincoln, the more I've come to understand that his words and actions were the careful result of his intense self-discipline. The silences that his law partner, William Henry Herndon, and his friends described as his melancholy were also a mask for his concentration, intellectual absorption, and focus, his depression, and his other feelings deepened his self-awareness and spurred his self-education, which informed his understanding of human nature and politics. Even when his life seemed to have been reduced to insignificance, he was scanning the horizons and interpreting its signs. The young Lincoln, in his first formal speech at the Springfield Lyceum in 1838, could see portents of a crisis to come. He didn't know what that crisis was, but he thought there might be one. At what point then, he said, is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. Now, this book, Wrestling with His Angel, describes Lincoln's dark night of the soul. Lincoln coming to his revelation of a house divided from which he emerged as the recognizable Lincoln of history. He would be that man until his assassination. After Abraham Lincoln's one term in the Congress and his return to his spare law office in Springfield, he stared into the distance for long periods of time. His partner, Herndon, recalled him breaking one of his silences with a cry of anguish. The political world was dead, Herndon wrote. Things were stagnant, and all hope for progress in the line of freedom seemed to be crushed out. Lincoln was speculating with me about the deadness of things and the despair which arose out of it, and deeply regretting that his human strength and power were limited by his nature to rouse and stir up the world. He said gloomily, despairingly, sadly, how hard, oh, how hard it is to die and leave one's country no better than if one had never lived for it. The world is dead to hope, deaf to its own 
death struggle, made known by a universal cry, what is to be done? Is anything to be done? Who can do anything? And how is it to be done? Did you ever think of these things? Almost as soon as Lincoln came back to Springfield, his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, turned him around and sent him on a mission to her hometown of Lexington, Kentucky, to serve as co-counsel to recover the Todd family fortune, which was considerable. Lincoln found himself thrust into the vortex of his native state's politics turned into mortal combat between anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces. The lawsuit and the politics were intertwined. So follow, if you will, just for a little bit, these threads. For nearly a decade, Mary's father, John S. Todd, Senator Henry Clay's business partner and political ally, had tried to wrest the Todd family estate from Robert Wycliffe, who was a wealthy lawyer known as the Old Duke. He had married Polly Todd, a Todd cousin who held the estate but passed away. Wycliffe was also the leader of the virulent pro-slavery movement. John Todd, running for the state senate, against that movement, though he was a slaveholder himself, was demonized as an abolitionist. And there was almost nothing worse than being called an abolitionist. It was like being called a communist in the 1950s. In the middle of the campaign in July 1849, he died of cholera. Lincoln arrived to pursue the family's case in October, just in time to observe the pro-slavery movement triumphantly rewrite the state constitution to eliminate the Kentucky law prohibiting the slave trade within its borders. Lincoln lost the case and the Todd family lost the estate. At the same moment that the political legacy of Henry Clay, Lincoln's early beau ideal of a statesman and Mary's beloved father's legacy was destroyed. If those events were not sufficiently embittering, there was another factor, a profound but concealed factor. From memoirs, journals, and pamphlets of the time, a mystery underlying the Todd Ayers v. Wycliffe case emerges. It was the Todd family secret. There was, in fact, a living heir. He was Polly Todd's grandson, the only child of her son, who had died at a relatively young age. But this heir was not legally a person. He was, in fact, a slave. And he had been emancipated and shipped to Liberia. In 1878, this former slave, the invisible man of the story, and he had a name, Alfred Francis Russell, was elected vice president of Liberia. And in 1883, he became president. So he was Mary Todd's second relation to become a president. <laughs> and the second Kentucky. <laughs> now back in Illinois from Kentucky, Lincoln spoke with John Todd Stewart, his first law partner and early political mentor, a conservative old Whig. The time would soon come in which we must become Democrats or abolitionists, said Stewart. And Stewart would eventually join the Democrats. When that time comes, my mind is made up, Lincoln replied. The slavery question cannot be compromised. Stewart added that he spoke in an emphatic tone. Lincoln expressed to many of his friends privately 
his anger at the rising slave power he had observed in Kentucky. He was livid that an anti-slavery Whig lawyer he knew in Kentucky named Samuel F. Miller had been driven out of the state for his views. Lincoln would later appoint him to the Supreme Court. Lincoln described young, thoughtless, and giddy-headed Kentucky slaveholders with slaves trudging behind them, the most glittering, ostentatious, and displaying property in the world. Lincoln would get excited on the question, said one of his friends, and believe that the tendency of the times was to make slavery universal. He told another friend, in a few years, we'll be ready to accept the institution in Illinois, and the whole country will adopt it. The Todd Ayers case, with its hidden history, left Lincoln smoldering in private until he emerged later. But the time for Lincoln to step forward had not come, not yet. A great revolution was required to bring Lincoln out of the wilderness. Lincoln's orbit in these years revolved around the 8th Judicial District of Central Illinois. Day after day with Judge David Davis, who was the maestro of all the lawyers, and what was called our coterie. I shall never forget the first time I saw Mr. Lincoln recalled Leonard Sweat, a criminal attorney who became one of Lincoln's closest colleagues and friends and would be instrumental in his campaigns. Sweat came to the town of Danville where Lincoln was trying cases. This is his recollection. When I called at the hotel, it was after dark, and I was told that he was upstairs in Judge Davis's room. In the region where I was brought up, the judge of the court was usually a man of more or less gravity, so that he could not be approached save with some degree of deference. I was not a little abashed, therefore, after I had climbed the unbannistered stairway to find myself so near the presence and dignity of Judge Davis, in whose, whose room I was told I could find Mr. Lincoln. In response to my timid knock, two voices responded almost simultaneously. Come in. Imagine my surprise when the door opened to find two men undressed, or rather dressed for bed, engaged in a lively battle with pillows. <laughs> tossing them at each other's heads. One, a low, heavy-set man who leaned against the foot of the bed and puffed like a lizard, answered to the description of Judge Davis. The other was a man of tremendous stature. Compared to Davis, he looked as if he were eight feet tall. He was encased in a long, indescribable garment, yellow as saffron, which reached to his heels and from beneath which protruded two of the largest feet I had up to that time been in the habit of seeing. This immense shirt, for shirt it must have been, looked as if it had been literally carved out of the original bolt of flannel of which it was made, and the pieces joined together without reference to measurement or capacity. The only thing that kept it from slipping off the tall and angular frame it covered was the single button at the throat. And I confess to a succession of shudders when I thought of what might happen should that button, <laughs> by any mischance, lose its hold. I cannot describe my sensations as this apparition with modest announcement, my name is Lincoln, strode across the room to shake my trembling hand I will not say he reminded me of Satan, but he was certainly the ungodliest figure I had ever seen. <laughs> Who was this Lincoln? Now, as I wrote in my first volume, A Self-Made Man, Lincoln was determined to leave his past behind, even to bury it as if hiding a humiliation. 
his impulse was to protect himself from revelations about his origins. As for the actual details of his early existence, Lincoln was stone silent. It was at a campaign rally in Illinois in 1856 that the man who had been extraordinarily reluctant about discussing his past, sensitive about his social inferiority, blurted out a startling confession. I used to be a slave, said Lincoln. He did not explain what prompted him to make this incredible statement, why he branded himself as belonging to the most oppressed, stigmatized, and untouchable caste, far worse than being accused of being an abolitionist. Illinois, while a free state, was the most racist in the North and had a draconian black code. Why would Lincoln announce that he was a former slave? The bare facts he did not disclose to his audience were these. Until he was 21 years old, Lincoln's father, Thomas Lincoln, had rented him out to neighbors. The father collected the son's wages. Lincoln was in effect an indentured servant, a slave. He regarded his semi-literate father as domineering and himself without rights. Now, Thomas Lincoln had led a harsh and unfair life. In Kentucky, he had been forced to compete for wages with slaves. He fled across the Ohio River to the free state of Indiana. He wanted his son to learn an honest trade as a laborer, perhaps to be trained as a carpenter like himself, and considered formal education a total waste of time, and reading to be a form of laziness, even hitting young Abraham for reading. And he sought to suppress any larger ambition as useless dreaminess. Lincoln spent only a few weeks in a frontier school and was entirely self-educated. Lincoln considered himself to have been held in bondage and to have escaped. His captivity as a boy he felt was humiliating and degrading, imprisonment in a world of neglect, poverty, fecklessness, and ignorance. It was at the root of his fierce desire to rise. If he was angry with his father, he also knew that his father had been reduced to a dirt farmer and compelled to flee Kentucky to escape himself from slavery. Slave states are places for poor white people to remove from, not to remove to, said Lincoln. Lincoln had been oppressed by a man who himself was oppressed. His father had made his escape. Lincoln was a fugitive son and a fugitive himself. Lincoln believed he had a fugitive experience and that he had, through his own efforts, his self-discipline emancipated himself. He was an oppressed and stunted boy who achieved his freedom. If with his disadvantages, he could do it, it could be done. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. But he was, as he insisted, naturally anti-slavery. His deepening understanding of slavery and its full complexity as a moral, political, and constitutional dilemma began in his childhood among the primitive Baptist anti-slavery dissidents in backwoods Kentucky and Indiana whose churches his parents attended. Those were unusual churches. As a boy, he rode down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. He was the original Huck Finn. 
And there he discovered the open air emporium of slaves on display, which shocked him. As a congressman, he lived in a boarding house on, the, on a site that is now occupied by the Library of Congress facing the Capitol. And that place was known as Abolition House. He experienced the invasion of slave catchers coming to seize one of the waiters as a fugitive slave. Undoubtedly, he knew the secret of the house where he lived, that it was a station in the Underground Railroad. He denounced the Mexican War as fraudulently started and voted numerous times against the expansion of slavery in the Western territories and the lands captured from Mexico. With the quiet assistance of the leading abolitionists in the Congress, he drafted a compromise bill for emancipation in the District of Columbia, which never received even a single hearing in the House of Representatives. And then he came home to an obscurity that seemed as though it would never end. At the lowest moment of political despair and retreat in American politics, marked by a widespread loss of faith in democracy itself, Lincoln emerged with his cause. Suddenly, in 1854, the once and future rivals of Lincoln combined to blow apart the cornerstone of civil and political peace. Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, seeking a transforming gesture that would gain him the Democratic presidential nomination and carry him to the White House, and Secretary of War Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, heir to slaveholding wealth and the de facto acting president of the United States operating behind the weakling Franklin Pierce, converged in their collaboration on the Kansas-Nebraska Act. That act repealed the Missouri Compromise that had forbidden slavery north of a line of middle latitude across the country and now made possible the extension of slavery to the West. In a stroke, the old political order cracked apart. We were thunderstruck and stunned, said Lincoln, and we reeled and fell in utter confusion, describing the atmosphere of the early resistance. But we rose, each fighting, grasping whatever he could first reach, a sigh, the pitchfork, a chopping ax, or a butcher's cleaver, we struck in the direction of the sound. In two brief autobiographies, Lincoln depicted himself in this wilderness period as strangely content in a kind of internal exile, becoming nearly indifferent to politics, immersed in his legal practice. He told the Chicago Tribune, in 1854, his profession had almost superseded the thought of politics in his mind when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused him as he had never been before. Well, it was about this decisive juncture in Lincoln's career that Herndon, his law partner, wrote of Lincoln's ambition. That man who thinks Lincoln calmly sat down and gathered his robes about him waiting for the people to call him has a very erroneous knowledge of Lincoln. He was always calculating and always planning ahead. His ambition was a little engine that knew no rest. Lincoln clung to the hull of the party of Lincoln for most of his life, the Whig party. But he clung to it longer than most people. Yet he knew a new coalition against the extension of slavery must be organized. In this period of party chaos, Lincoln cast himself into a whirlwind, sequestering himself. In the library of the Illinois State Capitol, he drafted a speech against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Stepping onto the podium to speak in the Hall of Representatives on 
October 4th, 1854, he never again left the stage of history. Lincoln, the defender of the Declaration of Independence and its precept that all men are created equal, invoked the blood of the revolution, the American Revolution. Lincoln, the Shakespearean, pointed to the moral wrong of slavery. It was, he said, wrong, wrong, wrong. Like the bloody hand, you may wash it and wash it. The red witness of guilt still sticks and stares horribly at you. In this period, many movements swirled across the landscape, for and against slavery, against immigrants, and against liquor. But the nativist and temperance movements had the effect of confounding the development of the anti-slavery one. Meanwhile, anti-slavery Democrats and anti-slavery Whigs with long grudges still regarded each other with mutual suspicion. Finally, on this very day that he, Lincoln delivered that speech against the Kansas-Nebraska Act, a small group of abolitionists came up to the podium afterwards. Uh, Lincoln knew them. Uh, and uh, they, he, they asked him if he would come that night to a meeting that they were holding for a group that they decided they would call the Republican Party. They, some of them were politically shrewd enough to understand that they needed a, an effective political figure who could work to draw all these elements together. And that's what brought them to Lincoln. But Lincoln dodged them. He said he had a law case at some other county courthouse, and he couldn't have this meeting with these radicals who called themselves the Republican Party, whatever that was. <laughs> the decline and fall of the Whigs didn't inevitably mean that there would be a new party of by and for Lincoln. There was no imperative except that which was within Lincoln himself. In retrospect, his closest contemporaries thought him prescient Lincoln's whole life was a calculation of the law of forces and ultimate results. The world to him was a question of cause and effect, reflected his friend Leonard Sweat, who had previously seen him in a pillow fight. Lincoln believed the results to which certain causes tended would surely follow. He did not believe those results could be materially hastened or impeded. His whole political history, especially since the agitation of the slavery question, has been based upon this theory. He believed from the first, I think, that the agitation of slavery would produce its overthrow, and he acted upon the result as though it was present from the beginning. His tactics were to get himself in the right place and remain there still until events would find him in that place. Now, John W. Bunn, who was a Springfield merchant, and the person who funded Lincoln's political campaigns. Yes, there was political fundraising. <laughs> Judge Lincoln unique among the politicians he had encountered. Lincoln's entire career proves that it is quite possible for a man to be adroit and skillful and effective in politics without in any degree sacrificing moral principles. Little men try to do the same things he did and make very bad work of it. They lack the high moral inspiration that animated Lincoln. Lincoln presents the most remarkable case in American history of a man who could be a practical politician and at the same time be a statesman in the highest sense of both terms. For years, Lincoln had turned over in his mind the menace of slavery to, dem to democracy until in 1855, he envisioned the prospect of what was to come. I think that there is no peaceful extinction of slavery for us. He wrote his co-counsel in the Todd Ayers case, George Robertson, who had been a Kentucky Supreme Court justice. The signal failure of Henry Clay and other good and great men in 1849 to effect anything 
in favor of gradual emancipation in Kentucky, together with a thousand other signs, extinguishes that hope utterly. This was in a private letter. There was another complicating factor. It entered into the equation. It was a major factor. Between 1845 and 1854, three million immigrants arrived in the United States, the first great wave. 40% poor Irish Catholics fleeing the potato famine. Another 40% Germans escaping the failed liberal revolution of 1848. Conservative Protestants viewed the Irish as a source of crime, corruption, and poverty. Both the Irish and Germans were beer drinkers, <laughs> a habit that aroused temperance crusaders who condemned them as drunken, lazy, and sinful. A new party came into being. This party was called the Know Nothing Party. It was called the Know Nothings because when members were asked if they belonged, they were told to reply, I know nothing. <laughs> it's, it sprang from a small sect in New York City called the Order of the Star Spangled Banner. Within months after the 1852 election, it attracted an estimated membership of more than a million. It, it had one platform plank, only one. Only native-born Protestants could hold public office in the United States. And its slogan, Americans only shall govern America. As the crisis deepened and these movements splintered politics. Lincoln wondered how he could be effective fighting slavery at the same time while maintaining his identity in a party that was crumbling beneath his feet. On August 24th, 1855, he wrote his intimate friend, Joshua Speed of Kentucky, with whom he had shared a room in Springfield and who was now presiding over his family's plantation. They agreed on many things and they disagreed on any number of things, including slavery. In the forefront of Lincoln's thinking was the threat of the know-nothings. I am not a know-nothing. That is certain, he wrote Speed. How could I be? How can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of de degrading classes of white people. Our progress in degeneracy appears to me to be pretty rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it will read all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. <laughs> when it comes to this, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty. To Russia, for instance, <laughs> where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. <laughs> that Lincoln had a way with words. <laughs> state by state, the new Republican Party was being organized. In Illinois, a group of anti-slavery newspaper editors invited Lincoln to join them as their leader at a meeting to organize a convention of the new party. Remember, he'd already refused them. Lincoln was absent at the time. He wasn't in his office, recalled Herndon. And believing I knew what his feelings and judgment on the vital questions of the hour were, I took the liberty to sign his name to the call. <laughs> John T. Stewart, Lincoln's first law partner, rushed into the law office and tried to remove the endorsement. He excitedly asked Herndon if Lincoln had signed the abolition call. I answered in the negative, adding that I had signed his name myself <laughs> to the question, did Lincoln authorize you to sign it? I returned an emphatic, no, 
Then exclaimed the startled and indignant Stuart, you have ruined him. <laughs> well, I thought I understood Lincoln thoroughly, Herndon wrote. But in order to vindicate myself, I immediately sat down after Stewart had left the office and wrote Lincoln, who was then in Tazewell County attending court, a brief account of what I had done and how much stir it was creating in the ranks of his conservative friends. If he approved or disapproved my course, I asked him to write or telegraph me at once. In a brief time came his answer. All right, go ahead, we'll meet you, radicals and all. At that meeting, on February 22nd, 1856, Washington's birthday, George Schneider, the editor of the leading German language newspaper, Staatszeitung in Illinois, based in Chicago, proposed a plank to denounce the know-nothings. The nativists present strongly opposed it. The conference threatened to collapse. There might not be a new party. Schneider announced finally that he would submit his resolution to Lincoln and abide by his decision. Gentlemen, declared Lincoln, the resolution introduced by Mr. Schneider is nothing new. It is already contained in the Declaration of Independence and you cannot form a new party on other principles. This declaration of Mr. Lincoln, Schneider recalled, saved the resolution and, in fact, helped to establish the new party on the most liberal democratic basis. Lincoln's judgment made possible the creation of the Illinois Republican Party, which became the vehicle that, in four years, would carry him to the Republican nomination for president. But he could not foresee that distant future nor could he predict the shocking 10 days that shook the world that would soon polarize and clarify the conflict. On May 19th, 1856, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts delivered a speech on the attack on democracy that he called the crime against Kansas. On May 21st, an army of nearly 1,000 pro-slavery Missourians, called the Border Ruffians, under a red banner inscribed Southern Rights, rampaged into the free state town of Lawrence, Kansas, to ransack it. The next day in the Senate, while Sumner sat writing at his desk, Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina came up to him and battered him relentlessly on his head with a gold-handled cane, nearly killing him. Blood streamed across the floor of the United States Senate. Two days later, on May 24th, along Pottawatomie Creek in Kansas, a radical abolitionist named John Brown and his followers hacked five pro-slavery men to death bleeding Kansas. Five days later, on May 29th, Abraham Lincoln stood on the podium at the founding convention of the Republican Party of Illinois and became a Republican. He was no longer a Whig. It was among the most significant events in the coming of the Civil War. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the transcendentalist sage of Concord, Massachusetts, would declare his mind mastered the problem of the day, and as the problem grew, so did his comprehension of it. Rarely was a man so fitted to the event. Within two years of assuming his new identity as a Republican, Lincoln sounded his own note of destiny. Lincoln's language was drenched not only in Shakespeare, but also drawn from two passages of the King James Bible. From the Gospel of Mark, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. From the Gospel of Luke, 
Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. On June 16, 1858, declaring his candidacy for the Senate against Stephen A. Douglas, Lincoln explained, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. Now recall just a few years earlier, he had lamented to Herndon, what is to be done? Can anyone do anything? But now he knew, and now he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. And by now, Lincoln's sense of historical time and political timing had become acute. Two weeks after his defeat to Douglas, he wrote to a friend, the fight must go on. The cause of civil liberty must not be surrendered at the end of one or even 100 defeats. In 1860, beginning his campaign for the Republican presidential nomination, in his speech at Cooper Union in New York, Lincoln concluded, neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us, nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction to the government, nor of dungeons to ourselves. Let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. Lincoln's political education was long, but many of the moments of Lincoln's awakening from this period of political slumber were not publicly known until years after his death. In early 1855, a free black woman in Springfield named Polly appeared at the office of Lincoln and Herndon with a tale of woe. Her young son, John, had hired himself out on a steamboat on the Mississippi, something like what Lincoln had done earlier. But when John reached New Orleans without free papers, proving he was not a slave, he was imprisoned and to be sold into slavery. Lincoln appealed to the governor, Joel Matson, a Democrat and close ally of Douglas, who informed Lincoln he could do nothing. Lincoln appealed to the governor of Louisiana, who also rejected his request. Again, he returned to the Illinois governor's office. Again, he was denied. So Lincoln and Herndon raised sufficient funds and located an agent in New Orleans to purchase the young man's liberty. Soon, his prison door swung open and he was returned to Springfield and his mother. Lincoln had bought a slave to free him. It was Lincoln's first act of emancipation. At about the same time, in early 1855, traveling the county court circuit, staying overnight in a boarding house, his discussion with a former judge and fellow lawyer, T. Lyle Dickey, a conservative old Whig, went on deep into the night. Judge Dickey contended that slavery was an institution which the Constitution recognized and which could not be disturbed. Lincoln argued that ultimately the slavery must become extinct, recalled another Illinois lawyer who was present. After a while, said Dickey, we went upstairs to bed. There were two beds in our room. And I remember that Lincoln sat up in his nightshirt on the edge of the bed, arguing the point with me. At last, we went to sleep. Early in the morning, I woke up, and there was Lincoln sitting up in the bed. Dickey said, Lincoln, I tell you, this nation cannot exist half slave and half free. Oh, Lincoln replied Dickey, go to sleep. <laughs> Thank you.
questions? <laughs> Do you want to come up to the mic or? Right behind you. First of all, thank you for coming to Louisville. Uh, I uh, saw the large tower of books at the Ford Museum and uh, the Theater Museum. And all of those books have drawn from different references over the years. And since Lincoln was a wartime president, I assume there is quite a bit of propaganda and other information that may not be true. What sources are you using for your books? And are you drawing from some of those books that have already been written that have discovered new information? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, it's often said there's nothing new to say about Lincoln because so many people have said so much. Um, but I think um, there's always something new and always new lessons to learn, especially from our own generation. Every new generation has something to learn from Lincoln and from uh, the periods of American history that he lived through and what he had to encounter and the difficulties he overcame. In terms of sources, it's, um, that is a very interesting question and it has been uh, revolutionized by the internet. And even as I've been writing this work now for about nine years, um, uh, things have changed and more and more material is put on the internet. Um, one can find uh, almost any article that's appeared in any journal at any time of the past. Google Books has put on uh, to the internet almost every book that uh, doesn't bear a copyright, the complete book. So you, they're only, uh, the, the whole 19th century is at your disposal. And I'm lucky enough to live in Washington where um, I'm a short car ride away from the archives and the Library of Congress. And so when I follow something down to a footnote from some other scholar, and there are, you know, really some of the best scholars are writing now. Um, and I am a little confounded. I can actually get into the archives and see the original documents. And you'd be surprised how fast those librarians can put a manuscript in front of you, you know, the original paper in the original hand of somebody, you know, a congressman, a newspaper editor, somebody who was part of that time. And so I've relied on all that, including memoirs, journals, um, done the best I can to put it together, uh, and pamphlets. Um, uh, in the case of um, um, the Todd, uh, Todd Ayers, um, I was able to locate uh, online um, obscure pamphlets that existed at the time um, that were um, uh, produced going back and forth between uh, Wycliffe and, uh, and, the, and the Todd family and their allies. And it's in those pamphlets that the Todd family secret exists. So uh, um, it was a preacher Presbyterian preacher from Kentucky named Breckenridge. <laughs> and he had been a state legislator, and his father was John Breckenridge, who'd been the attorney general for Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and uh, his name will come to me. But he, uh, he wrote a lot of these uh, pamphlets, and I was able to find them online. Uh, he was a major uh, figure who uh, eventually wound up having a speaking role at the uh, 1864 Republican Convention. So uh, there are all sorts of extraordinary figures who come to life suddenly, just through these, you know, dried papers and, you know, things that you can see on your computer screen. Right here is the microphone so others may hear you. Please. Um, thank you very much for coming. It's very interesting. So my question is, uh, you're holding a dinner party and uh, you invite Lincoln and you've got the current president and you've also got <laughs> Bill Clinton. So, um, and 
you know, Lincoln is saying, you know, a house, you know, a nation divided cannot stand. And, uh, you know, so um, the, current, the current occupant says, well, gee, what, what am I going to do about this? How do you envision that Lincoln would address the current situation with the current occupant? Well, first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull a Lincoln trick. <laughs> and then I'll answer the question. But the Lincoln trick is, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> I have, uh, I used to work at the Washington Post and I have a colleague and I had no idea what his background was and we worked together for years and one day I was in his house and he had something framed in the wall and it looked very old and I said, what is that? He said, well, um, that was the letter that Lincoln sent to my great, great grandfather asking him to be secretary of the treasury. Uh, he was a senator from New York, became governor. His name was Morgan. And um, Ed, I believe his name was uh, Edwin Morgan. And uh, he turned it down. <laughs> but he, he um, but um, passed down through the family was a story about a dinner party with Lincoln uh, where um, uh, this friend of mine, Dan Morgan, is a good writer. Um, uh, had spoken with, uh, was, remembered his grandfather telling, and I think, I think it was his grandfather, great-grandfather, um, there was, they were over at Morgan's house, Senator Morgan's house of New York, in Washington, and there were something like um, 11 chairs and they needed a 12th, so there was the little boy who became the great-grandfather, the grandfather, and um, Lincoln said, well, uh, bring him in. <laughs> and he sat him next to him and he spoke to him the whole night. <laughs> so that reminded me of that story. <laughs> and and, um, and I, you see, if I were Lincoln, I'd say, you know, I would wonder, you know, if we've forgotten about Trump already. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think we can talk about that um, after this event. And um, I'm reminded, uh, not quite Shakespeare, uh, but of the, um, the British version of uh, House of Cards, uh, where the leading character, Francis Urquhart, says, um, I don't know what you're going to say, but you might say that. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. It was a remarkable uh, presentation. I was interested in the, uh, the Todd family, uh, uh, pr president of Liberia. Uh, can you expand on that notion? What kind of president did he end up becoming? And is he yes. a historical figure in the history of Liberia? Or? Uh, he served briefly. Um, uh, and. Um, uh, he kept, a, uh, he wrote letters, kept a little journal um, that, uh, of when he was young and sent over there. It was a very difficult environment. Um, he said he found it uh, similar um, to Kentucky uh, in that um, there were very powerful people running things. <laughs> and um, uh, they were poor. And uh, in his own way, he rose. His mother died, his sister died. Uh, difficult existence. Um, uh, when I travel around and do all this, I meet all kinds of people. Um, and they come up when they have stories uh, about um, themselves, their families, uh, that touch on this. I was uh, about three weeks ago in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and I talked about Lincoln, and a man came up to me and said, um, I was originally from Liberia, I'm an American now, and I didn't know that whole story about Russell, but I know his whole family. <laughs> and uh, they're still there, and some of them are here, he said. So, um, it's, you know, this is a, uh, there's a lot of continuity to history. Uh, that carries on. <laughs>
It's one of the lessons I've learned. How, how, he didn't get anything. He didn't get anything. No, he asked Wycliffe to, um, it's interesting in his journals, he asked him to um, send him some law books so we could study the law. <laughs> it's interesting. Please. To use the um, um, Old Testament story of Jacob at the Jabbok, um, and you talk about issues that Lincoln wrestled with, uh, but he also wrestled with his faith. Uh, do you feel like he came to any kind of reconciliation? Uh, I feel like the angel was trying to give Jacob the faith. Did Lincoln ever take it? Well, we don't know about that. I, I, I have done my best to study this. Um, Lincoln was, um, raised in these uh, primitive Baptist churches, um, and um, uh, he attended them, uh, and uh, he knew the King James Bible, uh, and uh, he rejected it. He rejected the Calvinism that he was raised in and that he saw around him, in particular, because he objected to preachers he saw declaring ordinary people because of the problems in their lives to be sinful and he hated that so it set him off against religion uh, and he wrote a, um, a tract uh, in which he um, uh, declared uh, Jesus' uh, non-divinity uh, showed it to um, an older friend of his um, who grabbed it out of his hands and burned it, put it in a hot stove and said, I'm saving your political life. <laughs> um, Lincoln got in a lot of trouble in his first congressional race, uh, the only time he served in Congress. Uh, he ran against a man named Peter Cartwright, who was a preacher. He was a hellfire evangelical preacher. And the entire campaign was about Abraham Lincoln infidel. Uh, declaring that Lincoln uh, hated religion, didn't belong to a church, was a free thinker, uh, was disrespectful. So Lincoln had to issue a letter saying that he would not uh, support anybody who showed disrespect towards religion. But he never joined a church. He never uh, belonged to any organized religion. And whatever faith he had was very personal. He would go with his wife sometimes to church, I think to make her happy. Um, different friends of his say he wasn't religious. Other friends say other things. I don't trust all the preachers who claim to have converted him, uh, you know, which makes them very important. Um, he, he, you know, um, he had his own ideas about all this. The other thing that he also, uh, he studied theology closely and read theological works, but he did it, he did it all on his own. And uh, he particularly objected to um, uh, Southern uh, theology that justified slavery. Uh, the churches had split um, uh, in uh, beginning in the 1840s and it continued uh, between uh, north and south, and there were separation of churches. Um, and Lincoln read the Southern theologians and uh, intensely reacted against them. Um, and part of, part of the f intensity of feeling in the second inaugural, um, beneath it is, is that sense about um, throwing their Calvinism back at them about slavery and the that is the original sin. So Lincoln knew what he was talking about. I mean, he was very conversant um, in all this. But anyone who thinks they can get to the bottom of Lincoln's religion, good luck. <laughs> uh, I wanted to also thank you for your lecture. Very interesting, and I learned a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you.
One thing I wanted to touch on was, and you mentioned it briefly in your opening comments, was uh, what was referred to as his melancholia at the time, which uh, I think has been, in retrospect, determined was probably severe clinical depression at certain times in his life. Uh, and one of those was, uh, and you helped me with the name, I think her name was Anne, was it Anne Rutledge, his first passionate love affair? Anne, that, Anne Rutledge. And she died. And she he did. And he, and he fell into a, a severe depression. And if I've got my facts straight, I think it was Joshua Speed, who was back at, in, in Louisville at the time at Farmington, asked him to come to Farmington and come to less. He did. Because people were afraid he was suicidal. But my question to you is, how important do you think his depression was to how, what he was as a man and his empathy and his intelligence and what made him great? Um, undoubtedly, Lincoln suffered from what we would call depression. They called it melan melancholy. Um, uh, he had uh, episodes, particularly when he was younger, uh, that were n uh, near suicidal episodes. Um, remember, this is somebody who basically is without a family uh, living around Springfield. He's left his family. Um, they've gone elsewhere. He's gone, and um, he finds surrogate f uh, fathers and you know other people to live with, but he doesn't have a real family. Uh, he feels socially inferior. Um, he has no education, um, and he is um, rising entirely by dint of his own effort. And he is subject to uh, feelings of uh, humiliation when he feels ex himself exposed to this very small society that knows everybody and everything. Uh, and this is at a time when um, his courtships are not working out. There's, of course, the case of Anne Rutledge's death, which must have reminded him of the death of his sister, Sarah, uh, the death of his mother, um, all that severely depressed him. Um, but then he couldn't handle um, he, he, had, he was a rough frontier character who couldn't handle um, these genteel women he wanted to court. Uh, and uh, he, he, uh, one of them had wanted nothing to do with him because he had no, she felt he, was, he had no manners. And, um, and then he completely uh, ruined his chances with Mary Todd and didn't know how to handle it and uh, felt that everyone in town saw him as a fool and he became near suicidal. Um, uh, Ninian Edwards Jr., who was the uh, Mary Todd's brother-in-law, who was the son of the first territorial governor and the social leader of Springfield said, Lincoln went crazy as a loon um, and they had to take razors away from him. Um, but uh, after a while, um, uh, Simeon Francis and his wife, uh, the editor of the Sangamon Journal newspaper, to which Lincoln was also writing, uh, arranged a reconciliation in their sitting room between Lincoln and Mary Todd. It's a complex story that involves political dirty tricks that Lincoln and Mary Todd were involved in against an ally of Stephen A. Douglas. Um, and um, he gets married suddenly. She revolts against her family, which is the upper class of Springfield. She's a Southern belle. Um, she grew up, you know, with Henry Clay in her household. Um, and um, she attended a French finishing school in Lexington. Um, and, um, he was marrying up. Uh, she was known as, she was also very political uh, and she was opinionated and she would speak up in mixed company which was rare for women of the day. Uh, she had a volatile personality herself as we know um, and um, um, 
she married him. Her relatives thought he was a plebe. She thought she might make something of him. And um, uh, I think that that marriage um, changed Lincoln and that uh, there was no Lincoln without Mary. Um, and that um, she gave him a family, um, she gave him a place in society, um, uh, and uh, uh, he had a sense of himself as uh, belonging to the community in a way he didn't before. Uh, and there was never another suicidal episode. He would get very depressed. Um, I also think that Lincoln's depression um, was something he was very aware of because he had a keen understanding of human nature. And um, he really understood other people's motives. So the greatest politicians are people who understand human nature. And that's what Lincoln was able to do, incredible feats with people uh, in politics who were extraordinarily difficult that other people could not. And that's because he, he could see what their, their real motivations were. Um, it was said that Lincoln was the only man who could reach Charles Sumner, um, who was um, brilliant and uh, arrogant. But um, Lincoln understood that um, he had an incredible sensitivity and worried about rejection. And Lincoln felt that himself. So he could, he understood what to do. So another Lincoln, I'm just rambling along. So another Lincoln story. So Lincoln, uh, uh, Sumner is stewing in his, in his house. It's, um, it's, it's the time of, uh, it's the inauguration night, 1865. The inaugural ball's about to happen. Sumner is angry about something. And uh, no one can get to him and he's causing all kinds of political trouble. So Lincoln, on his way to the ball, pulls the carriage up to his house. And uh, pulls out Sumner and says, I'd really like you to um, bring the first lady into the ball. <laughs> Could she come into the ball on your arm? Sumner gets dressed, <laughs> gets in the carriage, and he is a very happy man. And he's listening to Lincoln. So Lincoln understood. his predisposition for, for depression. Uh, I've read that a lot of people think that his humor and his great storytelling were, in, in some regards, were defense mechanisms that he used intuitively to kind of stave off that, what he could feel coming. But what I specifically wanted your uh, feedback on was if you thought that that predisposition for depression created a certain empathy wisdom, intelligence that he wouldn't have had otherwise, and that innately that was a, do you think that was an important part of what made him great? Oh, yes. And uh, he used the humor in all sorts of ways. Um, Lincoln uh, used humor to uh, gauge a room, he, you know, of, politi of other politicians. Um, it was a way of seeing who was where and what they were up to and, um, and uh, uh, made him likable and so on. Uh, and he also, um, he would play with people sometimes. Uh, the, you know, this is the famous story, uh, it's a cabinet meeting, it's, um, uh, and uh, Lincoln calls the cabinet session and uh, uh, war is uh, not going well. And um, he says, I'd like to read you uh, my, uh, a story by my favorite humorist, Artemis Ward. Um, it's called um, uh, The Outrage in Utica, uh, Utica. And it's a, it's a 
ridiculous story about a con man with a traveling uh, circus of wax figures from the Bible that melt under fire and Judas Iscariot melts and you know and Lincoln's reading this thing and he knows that um, um, some of the members of his um, cabinet are very religious and that he is offending them uh, with this um, irreligious humor, frontier humor. And steam is coming out of Ed, uh, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton's ears. And uh, Lincoln says, all right, he says, uh, we'll put that aside. I have something else I want to read. I have a piece of paper here, pulls it out. It's the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> Stanton says, you can read the other story anytime you want. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, sir. But thank you so much. <clears throat> this is very insightful, whatever you had told us about Lincoln. And I love the way you sidestepped, um, you know. The <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so I'd like to ask you something. I mean, he, he was obviously a wonderful person and one of our most revered presidents. The question is more uh, about how he managed to get elected in the first place. You know, he was not the most charismatic. He had all kinds of issues going on, but he got elected. Uh, I'd like you to frame that, if possible, in the context of uh, the electorate in, in that era, and even today, for that matter. There was, there was no Twitter, there was no internet uh, in the 1850s, and yet he managed to convey his thoughts and beliefs in such a manner that he convinced a certain number of the population that elected him. So did he have a really strong support base or how did he convince anybody? If you could speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Well, that is a fundamental question. And so far I've written two volumes that, that deal with that at length. But let, let's just say, first of all, there was media then and um, um, uh, Lincoln was, um, completely attuned to the most modern media of his day, beginning as a boy. He was called a newsboy because he was so obsessed with reading newspapers. And the circulation in newspapers really um, grew a lot. He was one of the unusual frontier boys in Indiana who would read the Louisville Journal. Uh, and each copy of the paper would be passed around to dozens of people. They'd be saved. Um, and then the telegraph was invented, and you had a, uh, an explosion of newspapers. Lincoln was more or less the co-editor of one of the newspapers in Springfield. All the newspapers, for the most part, were political. They were partisan. They were party-oriented, one way or another. Um, they were different, but they were, they were partisan. And Lincoln wrote hundreds of anonymous editorials, and we don't even know all of them uh, that, were, that, were, that he wrote uh, in that newspaper. So, and um, he understood media very well. So for example, in the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates, he made sure that there were transcripts made of the debates, which he himself pasted together and had uh, published as a book. So, um, and when he delivers the Cooper Union Address, the place he goes afterwards is to the New York Tribune offices where he provides the text to make sure that the next day's paper uh, has it. Uh, Lincoln has a, uh, Lincoln was, the, was running for office from the age of 23 on. Um, he was the floor leader of the Whig Party in Illinois and the legislature at the age of 27. Um, he had a, a large network of uh, supporters. He was, became the leading Whig in the state of Illinois. And this business of him traveling around with uh, Judge Davis and so on, they were all political. They were all lawyers and they traveled around from courthouse to courthouse. And that was his network. That became the, uh, really the core of his campaign that put him in the 
in the Republican nomination. Davis goes to um, Chicago for the, uh, the nominating convention and is, sets himself up in a hotel and does the deals. Lincoln says, make no deals, and Davis is there saying um, to uh, Simon Cameron of Pennsylvania, um, uh, Pennsylvania goes for Lincoln, there may be a secretary ship of war involved. <laughs> um, Lincoln says, make no deals. <laughs> but every, every deal was kept out of that convention. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of shrewd bargaining that went on. He was very experienced um, in doing that. And in 1864, uh, he faced um, uh, the most uh, uh, violent uh, rhetoric and uh, smears uh, in a politics where people engaged in that sort of thing. Uh, he was, was a famous pamphlet called Abraham Africanus I, published. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, smears against him. Uh, I know that there's somebody who thinks he's the most um, vilified person ever in American politics, but uh, in 1864, in the middle of the Civil War, with the country's very fate at stake, um, Lincoln faced a lot more. So um, he was, um, and he, uh, if he had not been a practical politician, and had not been the great, um, the great uh, politico, he would not have been the great emancipator. The two were not separate people. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a Metro TV production.